Hi there, Doug Stimuno with IT Creations with Dell's R750 server we are building for a client. The system is equipped with Dell's integrated Dell Remote Access Controller or iDRAC, as are all PowerEdge servers for at chassis and remote management of the system. The current version is 9.0. This is a great tool for monitoring your server remotely as it is compatible with most browsers and provides a wealth of information. We've talked about iDRAC in the past, and I wanted to show you some of the features as I usually concentrate on the hardware. iDRAC can help manage one-to-many servers and has an easy-to-use graphical interface. We're not going to show everything as it monitors more than 5,000 system parameters, but this will give you a feel for it to see if it's something that you can use to manage your own network. iDRAC is embedded in every PowerEdge server and is available for use even before you've installed an operating system or hypervisor. It allows administrators to deploy, monitor, update, and manage PowerEdge servers remotely using a standard browser interface or at chassis using scripting. We will be looking at the remote browser options. If you want to see something for a little longer, just use the pause button to stop the action. There are four different licensing levels, Basic, Express, Enterprise, and Data Center. As you would expect, each upgrade offers the same features as the level below, plus a few more options. The version we are using today is iDRAC 9.0 Enterprise, which is an upgrade for our R750 server, which would typically come with iDRAC Express. Express is available on all 600 plus PowerEdge servers starting from, say, the PowerEdge R660. 100 through 500 series rack and tower servers have the basic license embedded with the option to upgrade to Express, Enterprise, or Data Center. Oh, and if you have multiple servers outfitted with iDRAC, no worries. There is a Dell EMC license manager that helps to manage the licenses and make sure you're up to date. If you're using some other third-party management platform with in-band management, then there's the iDRAC service module, which is a light version that can interact with both iDRAC and the legacy management platform you're using. But let's keep it simple and concentrate on what we do have, which is iDRAC 9.0 Enterprise. Are you interested in one of Dell's servers? Because if you are, then you should know that IT Creations is a preferred partner of Dell. We can get you what you need. The most up-to-date technology featuring the latest processors or recertified platforms from prior generation to drop in as a direct replacement. Click that link to visit itcreations.com. iDRAC works in conjunction with Dell's other management software options like Dell's Open Manage Portfolio. I will mention that iDRAC firmware may be different from one system to another. At the time of this video, we are using version 6.10.30.00. First, let's take a look at our 24-bay Dell PowerEdge R750 server, the subject of our dive into iDRAC. I've placed a few links below for information on the differences between the versions. This R750 features 24 front storage bays, and in this case, we've outfitted the system with a combination of SAS and NVMe storage devices, plus a boot-optimized storage subsystem, or BOSS add-on card. The BOSS is used to boot the system and can support dual M.2 drives for redundancy, with a card acting as a storage controller with limited RAID functionality. It's accessible from the back of the system for easy access to install the M.2 drives. You can also see how this system is outfitted in the iDRAC application. In fact, you will see every component listed in iDRAC and its status. The R750 can support a combination of SATA, SAS, or NVMe, or it can just have SATA, SAS, or NVMe drives exclusively. There are several different backplanes supported on this system, and you may need additional hardware to support your business needs. We're using the login credentials provided by Dell to access iDRAC. Once the customer takes possession of the system, it's recommended and assumed they will change the password. The administrator will typically set a static IP address that provides access to the system remotely or an internal network address to access the system in the network of the system is being tested or assembled. The credentials to log in might be at the bottom of the pullout tab or may just be the default root for username and Calvin for the password. The short version benefits of using iDRAC include configuration, firmware updates, automation of routine management activities, OS deployment, health monitoring, and troubleshooting and remediation. Once we log into iDRAC, you can see the dashboard, which provides an overall system status. That lower panel to the right, the virtual console, provides access to the BIOS on the R750 server, which is part of the operating system management tools and can do many of the same things as iDRAC. Notice all of the tabs at the top of the screen, dashboard, system storage, configuration, maintenance, and iDRAC settings. This is also where you can see the IP address we use to access iDRAC from our Chrome browser, if we didn't blur that out. At the bottom of the screen, you can see some recent logs, basically all the things we've done to the system, which is pretty much empty at this point. With view all clicked, 
That takes us to the maintenance tab, and we have a subset of tabs for more granular insight and control of the system. We're gonna clear the system event logs and start fresh and go back to the dashboard screen. We're gonna log out and start again. Once again, Upper Left says we have a healthy system for both general system health and storage health. Once we click the system tab at the top of the screen, we have a set of subheadings for summary, batteries, cooling, CPU, front panel, accelerators, intrusion, memory, network devices, power, and voltages. All pretty much self-explanatory once we click on those tabs. That first one, batteries, will show the battery for the flashback cache for the PERC controller, and then the CMOS battery, which is that little round battery on the system board to ensure administrator passwords to the system are stored. Next, we'll see how cool the system is based on sensor data. We have a tab for fans and one for temperatures. And you can see the CPU temperatures listed there as well. That export link is available on most screens and enable administrators to download a PDF file of the current system status for that specific set of data. The CPU tab tells us exactly what type of CPU is installed. And notice there is a CPU1 status and CPU2 status. In this case, dual Intel Xeon scalable silver 4310 CPUs from the third generation with 12 cores each. Then there's a live feed of the front panel LED lights on the actual system in real time. If we had a GPU accelerator or FPGA, which is a field programmable gate array installed on the system, the accelerators tab is where they would appear. The information provided includes a number of variables, including the firmware version for the GPU or FPGA cards. The intrusion tab keeps track of the intrusion sensor mounted just under the cover panel. It will track if the server cover has been removed. Next, the memory tab shows every memory module in the system, in every slot. In this case, we have one 16 gigabyte module installed in slot A1, and you can see the memory speed supported by that module. That network devices tab will show our NICs, or network interface controllers. In this case, the system comes outfitted with two gigabit ethernet RJ45 ports, only one of which we are currently using. If you look at the additional set of tabs, you can see one is for the embedded NICs and the other integrated NIC1. That last one we installed, a Broadcom NetExtreme Gigabyte Ethernet BCM5720 in one of the PCI slots. The power tab shows the dual redundant power supply units located in back of the chassis and their status. You can also track power consumption on the graph over several time frames. Right now it's showing watts over the last hour. Voltages shows the general power consumption of everything on the system. PCI slots is where it gets somewhat interesting and you can see the slot number, the number of PCI lanes for each slot, the status, all enabled since we have both processors installed, the type of slot, physical length of the slot, slot type, and which CPU is actually in charge of that slot. I will mention slot bifurcation is supported on the system. Going back to the main tabs on the storage tab is very useful. Here we have a visual representation of the front of the server with all storage bays numbered from zero to 23. If you look at the pie chart below, you can see all 24 drives are ready and active. Two more drive bays in back are online. Those would be installed in the BOSS controller for OS support. The disk summary shows all 26 physical disks and we have a virtual disk. In the first 16 bays, we have SAS HDDs with a capacity of 2.2 terabytes. Bays 15 through 19 are outfitted with 750 gigabyte NVMe SSDs and 20 through 23 with 3.7 terabyte NVMe SSDs. The controllers tab in the storage section provides information on the BOSS, which can support two NVMe M.2 drives and a RAID 1 using SATA bus protocol for support of the OS in mirror mode for redundancy. The PERC H745 front controller, or FPERC, provides support for the SAS drives installed in the system in bays 0 through 17. The PERC H745 has 4 gigabytes of non-volatile flashback cache memory, which is powered by a small battery, and is also listed. NV Cache technology can back up data to non-volatile memory in the event of a power loss and can store that information nearly indefinitely. The physical disks tab shows the two BOSS drives in back first, slots number 0, 1, and then we see a list of the other drives installed on the front panel and there are three pages of information. We do have one virtual disk currently and again that's the BOSS with its built-in controller. The enclosures tab shows backplane 1 which is our main front storage area with 24 drives. As you can see, there's a button to allow for the creation of a virtual disk, and the pie chart shows all disks are ready. We use that button to create a virtual disk with the BOSS controller earlier. Once we hit the drop-down menu, you can see the PERC H745 controller too. Returning to the main dashboard, we can access BIOS on the R750 from the virtual console. That utility has much the same information as iDRAC. We're gonna create a RAID using the device settings under system setup for the Dell PERC H745, which will host the SAS drives on the system. 
We go to the dashboard, view, then main menu and configuration management and choose create virtual disk. Here we can select the RAID level and choose the specific drives using the select physical disks link. In this case, we're gonna create a RAID 10 configuration with eight of the 16 SAS drives using unconfigured capacity. We choose the first eight disks in the chassis in drive bay zero through seven with a 2.182 terabyte capacity. Click apply changes at the end of the list of drives and then confirm changes by clicking yes. We then do the same thing for the other drives located in bays eight through 16. In this case, we'll create a RAID 5 configuration. Again, we choose our disks. In this case, we can check all as there are only eight drives left since we have unconfigured capacity checked. Then apply changes and confirm again. When we check in virtual disk management, there are two virtual disks, zero and one. Zero has the RAID 10 configuration, which needs at least four disks and features mirroring and disk striping. With mirroring, we have essentially cut our actual storage from those drives in half because the information is being duplicated on another drive. So if one fails, it's replaced by the other with duplicate information. With all those eight drives supporting basically 2.2 terabytes, all eight add up to 17.6 terabytes of storage space. And as you can see, we're at about half that capacity with 8.73 terabytes available. The other set using RAID 5. RAID 5 also delivers more redundancy, but still enables large volume sizes using disk striping with parity. With this RAID level, data is striped across three or more disks with parity information stored across multiple disks. In this case, since we have a total volume of 15.278 terabytes, one of the drives in the RAID acts as the hot spare, and it too has a capacity of 2.2 terabytes. So if you add that to the 15.278 terabytes, we have roughly 17.478 terabytes of capacity. The hot spare doesn't contain any data until there is a failure of one of the other drives. The controller will automatically begin to rebuild the failed drive using the hot spare if there is a failure. I contend that a bit for brevity. If you notice that pie chart again, you can see there are 18 disks with ready status. Those would be the two RAIDs we just did, RAIDs 5 and RAID 10, plus the RAID 1 for the BOSS dual M.2 drives operating in mirror mode 910. Under the configuration tab, there are more settings. Clicking on the system settings tab, you can see a few more options, one of which is alert configuration. Alert configuration allows administrators to tell the system to send alerts when there's a problem. At the moment, that setting is off. The quick alert configuration link provides a list of items that when compromised will initiate an alert. Next, another set of options under alert configuration with another set of tabs for more granular information on alerts and several different ways to receive a notification. Email, SNMP, IPMI, alert, etc. We can also set the first boot device under hardware settings. Here we can see the lifecycle controller which we initiated from a previous boot but you can also grab from the boot drop-down menu at the top of the screen and we're still in BIOS. As I said at the beginning, there are 5,000 system parameters and we're not gonna be getting to all of them. This is probably a good place to stop for now. We may return to this topic to show a few more features and settings because it is quite easy to get lost in all that information. If you have any questions, post them in the comments section below. And if you wanna see more server and workstation reviews from IT Creations, then click that subscribe button. Visit itcreations.com for all your server needs or if you just need some critical part to get your network up and running. If it is critical, we will call you back and can arrange for parts even over the weekend or late night. Until next time, I'm Doug Stuman with IT Creations and thanks for watching.